Um, welcome everybody. Um, let's turn to slide three uh, to kick, kick us off. Um, you'll see from the descriptor at the top of that slide that we've inserted the word solutions into um, the way we talk about ourselves. Mm. That's because it's a part of the market that's becoming increasingly um, visible. It's a part of our business that we've done well for a long time and we wanted to shine a bit of a light on it during this um, uh, review. Um, MatchTech was always a specialist in some great markets and continues to be. And what we've been doing over the last two and a half years since uh, we acquired Networkers and became Gattaca is applying the same methodology and the same model that we've developed over 30 odd years in engineering. First of all into technology and then rolling that model out across the world through our, our new branch network. Um, we are, we are very much seen by our clients as specialists and that's uh, important to stress mm -hmm. because they really value the fact that we understand their sectors and their skill sets deeply. Uh, we have a point of view. We can consult and advise them on skills shortages, uh, who's hiring, who's not, um, what the premier are to make a, a job move. And that degree of um, specialization does, isn't uh, reflected right across the industry. Um, we have a very experienced and well-established management team. We have an SMT, senior management team of uh, 31 people. And in aggregate, we've got 571 years experience in recruitment. Now I chip in most of that, but even without me, that's quite a, a lengthy average. And again, that experience has mm -hmm. some value uh, to our clients. Uh, we have um, a very engaged and extremely productive workforce. We believe it's the most productive workforce within the listed recruitment sector. Um, if you look at our NFI per head or NFI uh, per pound of uh, staff costs, it's uh, right up there at the top. Uh, our conversion ratio, that's the conversion of gross profit to operating profit, again, is the highest in our peer group. And finally, um, the confidence we've got in our growth strategy, coupled with the very high level of recurring revenues in our business, because we're contract-led, uh, provides a stable environment for our progressive dividend policy. So moving on to slide four, um, those of you who've been here before will have seen this map and um, we've added two new offices uh, this year so we're up to 15 offices worldwide and uh, what's new is Madrid and Munich. Um, some of you will remember that we talked about winning a pan-European managed service program with um, Unisys 18 months or so ago and uh, we've now established legal entities and obtained licenses um, in nine countries and the revenues that flow from that contract gave us the confidence to open up a physical presence in those two cities. Um, we've actually moved on from simply supplying staff to Unisys uh, to providing a, a range of recruitment services um, to other customers as well. And um, Madrid is already profitable. Uh, Munich is on budget and set to be profitable uh, this year. So again, further diversifying our business um, away from the UK internationalizing our business and taking uh, the benefit of what is a very hot recruitment market in continental Europe right now. Moving on to slide five, um, it's uh, very pleasing to be able to report that despite the negative NFI we reported on uh, for the year ended 31st July, I'm pleased to say that our engineering and indeed our total UK business is back to growth uh, year to date to September. So only two months in but uh, very positive signs in that um, early period. Engineering technology is a business that we created um, two and a half years ago when we acquired Networkers because we saw the opportunity in the convergence between engineering and technology. Uh, it's now one of our biggest business units and uh, uh, one of the fastest growing. We've still got some um, work to do in uh, UK technology. Uh, we're running slightly behind last year on a year-to-date basis, but we've now got a very clear sales and marketing strategy. Uh, the newer business units that we've established are growing and corrective actions being taken where it's needed. On international, uh, I'm actually really pleased with the progress we're making here. Um, we've made investments and we're now seeing a return on those investments. <coughs> we had terrific growth from the US in the second half of last year. It actually grew 50% half two on half two. 
and we saw China kick into growth in Q4. And with the actions we've taken in Middle East and Africa, we expect that to return to growth this year. And um, recruitment solutions, which I referred to in my introduction, is what we used to call our managed accounts business. It's now 20% of the group and it's growing, and I'll talk more about that later. Moving on to the highlights um, on slide seven, uh, group NFI growth of 2% was down 4% on a pro forma basis, and by pro forma, I mean in constant currency, uh, taking RSL as if we'd owned it for both years under review, and excluding any discontinued businesses. UK engineering was down 3%, but we recovered half of that NFI variance through um, a reduction in staff costs. UK technology down 6%, and we recovered 20% of that through staff cost reductions. Less than in engineering, because we're restructuring and repositioning that business on more attractive market segments. So we <coughs> were uh, investing in a new headcount to, to address those markets. International was 4% lower, but very strong growth in what is our priority uh, US market of 27%, masked by uh, contract reductions in South Africa in particular. The networker's uh, operational integration is now complete and we go to market uh, as, a, as a unified business. And RSL, the business that we acquired in February this year, um, is performing in line with expectations and in line with the equivalent businesses in MatchTech. And we're just about to start the integration of that business, moving the finance function down from RSL's office in Reading to our hub in Whiteley. And we're maintaining our dividend of 23 pence per share, given our confidence in the future. So with that, I'll hand you over to Salah. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. So on slides eight and nine, you can see the numbers there. So I won't go through the uh, numbers in, in detail, but just to really make two specific points here. First of all, um, our uh, profit conversion ratio, so the ratio of our EBIT to gross profit, <coughs> whilst lower than prior year, stands still at 23%. And that's um, still an industry leading figure. So obviously we're looking forward to bringing that back up again as our um, NFI returns to growth and as we uh, increase the ratio of sales to support staff but still at 23%, um, that, that's a very good ratio. And the other point I'd just like to make is that um, for our UK business, on a light for light basis, we're 4% down. And um, again, compared to our listed peers, that's um, uh, actually you know, a sort of at the top end of the pack. So whilst we would like to have seen higher growth, we have held our own uh, reasonably well. Moving on to slide number 10, which is the main um, explanation of the movement of underlying PBIT. Our underlying uh, PBT went from 20.4 million last year to 16.2 million this year. And so I'll just take you through the, the, the key parts of that. So the first bar on slide 10 is the net currency movement. So 0.4 million increase to our um, PBT. That was broken up as 2 million uh, increase on NFI and uh, 1.6 million increase on cost. So that's simply um, the impact of moving currency rates uh, on our overseas operations. Then the next bar is um, the RSL impact. So we owned um, RSL for half of the year and um, uh, that had a 0.7 million impact on our PBT. RSL has given us um, increased uh, expertise in, in the niche rail business and in addition to that it's given us exposure to that business outside of the London, uh, London which is very positive and in fact we're also seeing um, some benefits internationally from, from that expertise. Moving on to the next bar, NFI, um, so excluding currency impact and uh, RSL was 3.2 million lower. The primary parts of that was UK engineering NFI um, being 1.2 million down on a pro forma um, basis, that reduction was 1 million or, or 3%. H2 for engineering was actually flat year on year. So in H2, we saw us, ourselves coming out of um, the trough and, and um, returning to some modest growth um, in, in the early part of this year. 
UK technology was 1.7 million or 8% lower than prior year. And as um, Brian mentioned, whilst our international business on a light for light basis was 4% lower, that actually doesn't really tell the story of, of what's happening there. So our US business is showing very strong growth, 20% year on year, um, and actually 50% H2 versus H2, which we're extremely pleased with. China was 18% up year on year, but um, unfortunately South Africa was 25% lower, masking the, uh, the, the real momentum internationally, as, as Brian explained. Then moving on to the next bar, staff costs are 1.2 million higher. That was driven by 1.3 million uh, pound investment in sales staff, um, which again we will cover a little bit later, pr primarily in the Americas but also in Asia. And uh, an investment of 0.6 million in our uh, business development and client services um, headcount. So that's a sales operation, which again we will cover a, a, a little bit further down the line the line and that's an area where again we're seeing very good traction. Group support costs were 0.7 million pounds lower and that was really the tail end of the integration synergies from the networkers acquisition. Other administrative costs were 0.9 million pounds um, higher, there was two primary elements within that, 0.6 million relating to our new office um, in uh, London Bridge um, which we've had for nine months now and um, that office gives us access to the critical talent pools both for consultants and for um, uh, candidates in London but also a professional Gattaca branded office for client and customer meetings. And uh, the other piece of that was other overheads being 0.3 million pounds higher. That was driven by um, investment in HR, legal, IT and contractor support. Contractor support is where we've centralised some of the administrative tasks from our sales operation so that our sales people can be focused on selling rather than admin. And um, the other areas of investment have helped us uh, with our pan-European offering to service important customers such as Unisys. And um, there was a slight reducing factor also in, in, in that other headline being lower um, uh, management bonus accruals um, for, uh, at year-end. So all of that brings us to 16.2 million profit before tax. On the next slide, um, slide 11, um, <coughs> our tax rate is, is uh, high, so 36.1% um, or 39.1% excluding um, items relating to prior year. This is driven by withholding tax, non-recoverable withholding tax, which in fact on a cash basis we do recover because we charge higher fees um, to our customers where we have that situation. But we are um, doing two things there. We, we are um, looking at our legal entity structure to identify opportunities to try and recover more of that from, from our corporation tax bill. Um, but also we're doing an end-to-end -end review of, of that whole area because obviously it, it does have a significant impact on our um, uh, uh, headline tax rate. On slide 12, cash flow and net debt. Um, so our net debt has gone from 25 million uh, at the end of 2016 to 40.3 million in July 17, and um, the principal items, other than um, obviously our EBIT and, and, and adjusting for non-cash items, are first of all 11.2 million um, related to the acquisition of RSL, so the 70% um, that we own, and um, a 5 million increase in working capital. Um, within that, 3.8 million is related to trade receivables, where our um, DSO, our data days, have increased from 50 to 55. And that's driven by a, a, a number of factors. So uh, half a day related to a specific debt where we had to set up uh, unusual administrative arrangements um, to collect that debt, so it was a perfectly good debt, uh, it is now collected, so that issue has gone away. Um, and around one and a half days related to the combination of RSL, so RSL has typically operated a higher DSO than, than um, the rest of our business, so just that amalgamation increases DSO. But the rest of it is where um, we could have been more effective, and so we've taken some specific actions to bring improvements, and in fact we have already achieved improvements since year-end. Those specific actions include transferring all of our UK 
receivables activity to our Whiteley offices where we're um, particularly good at that activity. Um, some changes in the US uh, to make us more effective uh, in, in how we're managing the receivables there and um, putting uh, the RSL standard terms at the same uh, level as MatchTech, which, which is um, uh, better from the company's perspective. And of course, more close uh, monitoring of uh, cash collections and DSO, not only by myself and my team, but actually by the entire management team. So um, with all of those together, whilst I think um, it will be a challenge to return to 50 days DSO, certainly I would expect an improvement on 55. And as I explained, we've, um, we've already achieved some improvement. Then uh, the um, other piece of working capital was a 1.2 million reduction in trade and other payables. That was a, a result of lower provisions for bonuses and commissions and um, lower accruals for contractor payables at, at, at year end. And then finally, capital expenditure was 1.4 million. Um, that included investment in software, in HR and in accounting. And in 2018, we've started a, a process to um, look at our front office, our CRM uh, systems and uh, our middle office paying bill systems. And so um, uh, as we go through that, um, we're still um, refining the, the, the exact cash flow imp impact of, of, of that activity, but I would expect somewhat higher capex in 2018, probably one and a half times to two and a half times what it was in 2017. So that gives us our net debt of um, 40.3 million, that's 2.2 times adjusted EBITDA. Um, if we had owned RSL for the whole year, that ratio would be 2.1 times and we believe that's um, a, a comfortable level um, for us to manage our business. Thanks Stella. So on to slide 14 now, the headcount slide. Uh, total headcount for the group went up from 753 last year to 869, so up 116. Most of that's in the UK, where we went from 580 to 670, and most of that was as a result of the acquisition of RSL, uh, where we acquired 85 additional um, headcount. Um, so the true organic growth was really in the international business, uh, where we grew Americas by uh, 20 heads from 57 to 77, so a 35% increase in headcount, which as we've said uh, already, delivered a 50% improvement in NFI in the second half. Uh, Asia went up um, 7 from 49 the prior year, so plus 14%, and again, now delivering decent growth. And Middle East and Africa were reduced down slightly on the back of disappointing results from that region. There's a ratio at the bottom of that slide that you can see uh, between sales and non-sales mm. staff of 71-29. Uh, we believe that an appropriate ratio for this business would be 75-25, and we intend to get to that um, in the next 12 to 18 months. And obviously, upon achievement of that, it'll have a beneficial impact on our conversion ratio. Looking at our international business first, as this is where we see a great deal of our future growth coming from, um, on slide 15, you can see that we uh, started the year slowly. The first half was down 9%, but we drew level in the second half, and we're now seeing some good growth. Uh, contract NFI was down 12% due to um, shortfalls in demand from Ericsson in the US and some margin reductions at uh, Huawei in Asia and South Africa. But PERM was up 7% as we uh, diversified our client base and rolled the MatchTech brand out in Asia and the Americas. And you can see on the bottom right graphic on that slide that uh, engineering, i.e. match tech, is up from 24% of international NFI last year uh, to 30% in the year under review. So total NFI was down 4%. Um, you can see from the pie chart that uh, PERM is bigger internationally than it is in the UK. That's because uh, the, the two big contract markets in uh, recruitment are the UK and the US. In most of the rest of the world, it's mainly a permanent placement business. Um, Americas is our biggest region, as you can see on the bottom left. And from a country point of view, the US is our biggest single market, followed by South Africa and then China. <coughs> so moving on, um, the growth drivers uh, it, behind that growth in the Americas um, 
which grew 8% over the year, but really took off in the second half when we grew 27%. Um, it's mainly a technology business country currently. Um, we're doing a lot in development, particularly in mobile app development, in fintech. Um, so um, that's a very good market for us. Uh, cybersecurity is hot in the States. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, Fujitsu. And uh, technical sales um, is a very good market for us um, around the world, but particularly in the US. Um, and in fact, we won a, a large contract with a company called Imagine, Communica Imagine Communication Software uh, last year, which has been very, very lucrative for us in the US, Asia, and the UK. On the engineering side, energy is coming back. We're dealing with clients like TDF and Shell in Mexico. Um, EngTech is a good uh, business for us. We're uh, targeting the tech hub in Austin. And we've got a couple of sales guys out there who are um, selling our services, but they're being delivered from the uh, hub office in Dallas. So very similar to the model that we've got in the UK with the Whiteley hub. And we won our first automotive client in Mexico uh, recently. We're particularly pleased with the rollout of MatchTech in Asia. Um, we're doing a lot of work in, in Malaysia on uh, the high-speed rail link between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, dealing with firms that are familiar to us like uh, WSP and Mott McDonald. And in China, we launched the MatchTech brand in the middle of last year and had an immediate impact. We've now got a team of eight and doing very well in automotive and um, infrastructure. So the Q1 forecast for international is for very strong growth in the Americas and Asia and a marginal decline in Middle East and Africa before that returns to overall to growth later on in the year. Looking at our engineering business uh, in the UK, um, including RSL, contract was at 1%, but PERM down 15%, so total NFI down 4%. But as I said earlier, we're back to growth now year to date on both temp and PERM. You can see how the engineering sector is split on the bottom left. And uh, if you move to slide 18, you can see what's driving uh, the growth we're now seeing uh, in each of our main markets. Um, rail was a challenge for us in infrastructure last year as um, electrification programs were cancelled. However, we're now adding clients again and um, growing. Highways, uh, again, a bit of difficulty last year with uh, Highways England cancelling some of the smart motorway projects, but they're now uh, back on track and um, Highways England have awarded contracts to their contractors who are our clients, so they know what they've won and they're starting to spend with us. Uh, energy has finally bottomed out after the oil price shock. It was down 3% last year, but is now growing again. And that growth is coming from renewables, particularly European offshore wind farms and also some movement in nuclear. Maritime was down 21% last year. Um, we expected to get the Queen Elizabeth carriers into Portsmouth and they didn't arrive before the year end, but they are there now. And um, we're pleased to say that that business is, is growing again and the Canadian uh, National Shipbuilding Program continues to be a great source of revenue for us. Aerospace had a very good year last year. Mm. It grew by 13% and we've taken that success and started to um, roll out what we do to continental Europe as well as in the UK. Automotive, um, poor year last year, down 12%, but uh, back to growth again this year with manufacturing and maintenance um, skills at Ricardo, BMW and JLR amongst others. And finally, engineering technology, uh, one of our most exciting businesses which grew 19% last year and is growing 20% plus this year with companies like Nats, um, the air traffic control people and Safran as key clients. Turning to technology, it was a challenging year on slide 19, contract NFI down 7%, PERM down 8%, total down 6%. As you'll hear, we have had success in establishing and growing some new specialist areas, um, very much building on the model we had for Match Tech, but this hasn't been enough to offset the slowdown in some of our legacy businesses. So um, we're getting the growth uh, on slide 20 from development, which focuses on placing staff on web-based projects, had a slow first half of the year, but much improved in the second half, and that momentum's continued into 2018. Um, we're seeing a positive growth in our cloud business uh, to offset a decline in our e ERP business. Um, a lot of uh, ERP is now moving to the cloud, and we're benefiting from that. Uh, security is a growth area from us, and this is a new business unit which doubled its NFI last year. 
uh, so double from a small base, but we're adding headcount all the time, and GDPR is um, resulting in even more demand in this space. Uh, leadership, which is project management, change management, grew 5%, and uh, that's continued into 2018. And in telecoms, uh, we grew our new connected world business, um, which uh, doubled last year, albeit again from a small base. Moving on to slide 21, I wanted to talk about uh, Gattaca Solutions. Uh, this is um, a real opportunity as we see it, uh, in that the, the world of work is changing, there are new models emerging between employers and employees, with the gig economy, with statement of work increasingly being asked for by our clients, with uh, the prevalence of RPO, recruitment process outsourcing, and MSP, managed service programs, all uh, conspiring to shake up the market. Um, this is a business that we've always done, but re never really separated it out for the benefit of our investors until now. Uh, it's a very attractive market. MSP alone is worth $100 billion. And what's interesting about that is that three quarters of that spend is by companies who have uh, relatively small amounts of spend under management, $50 million or less. And that's a real sweet spot for Gattaca because we have a number of um, fairly substantial clients who have an acute demand for um, skills short uh, people, uh, but who are looking for a supplier who can take some of the headache of managing that contract and perm requirement off their hands, as well as providing some value added services. So um, what we've done is to um, systemize and productize what we already do and to take it to market as Gattaca Solutions. At the moment, we have 26 uh, accounts under management. They represent about 20% of our NFI, and that basket of businesses grew by 17% last year. Uh, just in the last week, we won another substantial account, which I can't disclose yet, but when I tracked the sales process back, we started talking to that company about a year or two years ago. So there's a long sales cycle, but we've been selling this product for some time and we've got a nice pipeline of opportunities uh, which are now starting to come through. So uh, it's about RPO, it's about MSP, but it's also about providing um, strategic consulting services to our clients. We're uh, helping them with their employer brands, we're helping them with their employer value proposition, we're carrying out engagement surveys on their behalf, and really advising them uh, in a way that uh, is, is more than just providing uh, the recruitment services that they need. So we think it's got a lot of uh, potential and will be a big part of our uh, revenue and growth story going forward. So that really takes us to the uh, outlook. Uh, we're rolling up everything that I've said already. Um, despite uh, disappointing numbers last year, uh, we, we see that as being behind us. And UK Engineering, which is our core business, it's 60% of the group, is now in good shape and growing again. Our solutions business that I've just referred to is gaining momentum. Uh, technology still has some challenges and we're seeing low single digit declines year on year um, to the end of September, but that is only 20% of our total business and we do have corrective actions in place. Perm is now back to growth, it's up 11% in the UK year to date. Um, and international, the other 20% of our business is showing very good growth and we expect an extremely good uh, quarter one on Perm. So despite the continued uncertainty in the UK market, we're actually very um, or cautiously optimistic for 2018 in full. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. Very clear and transparent. Uh, we have a number of questions already. I'll remind the audience if you want to submit any, please do so via the, the icon top right. But let's dive straight in, uh, probably continuing on from your last point, uh, Brian. The UK is still a very important market for you. Could you act as a thermometer uh, and contrast the relatively steady UK growth statistics uh, and the subsequently employment demand that's being reported relative to the political uncertainty uh, and the government's uh, problems there? And then following on from that and how that affects the outlook for your largest uh, division, could you say a little bit more about whether you're seeing more skilled candidates in the UK actively seeking new jobs abroad? Okay, well, I think um, last year was 
very much a function of um, the external market on our uh, UK engineering numbers particularly. Um, our year end is uh, July, obviously the referendum was in June and I think we got the, the full impact of the uncertainty that that um, referendum result created. A lot of employers decided to postpone hiring decisions or add a layer of um, further interviewing before making those decisions. A lot of candidates actually decided to um, hunker down and not look for a new job on the basis that uh, they weren't sure what the future would hold. Obviously that's some time ago now and my feeling is that that's in a sense behind us and our clients have decided that they just need to get on with their lives um, and that's one of the reasons that we've seen our perm business come back this year. That said, uh, we do have uh, continued uncertainty as to the, uh, the outcome of that vote and what Brexit will actually look like. Uh, we also have a um, particularly weak government uh, which will have difficulty driving through um, its intentions. So I don't think that we're out of the woods yet, um, but uh, I do think that the actions we've been taking have enabled us to take some market share and get back to growth in a difficult market. So I'm in, encouraged by that. Uh, in terms of um, UK candidates looking for work overseas, we're not seeing any spike uh, in that um, at, at all. Um, it's very much business as usual right now. And indeed, most of what we do in our international network is um, in-country nationals uh, being placed uh, uh, in, in their own countries. There's very little uh, movement of labor around the world in, in what we do, other than in a very distinct part of our business in, in telecoms, where we move a lot of um, contractors from uh, China into Africa. That's the main candidate flow. Nothing to do with uh, the EU. OK, thank you. And then, uh, uh Pursuing that theme and looking at international revenues, a uh, long time ago now, would you say, given the very good momentum that you're seeing in the US and in the fourth quarter, uh, you are happy with where you are having bought networkers uh, relative to uh, the, the, at the time of acquisition? And looking forward, um, given that momentum, do you think you can now outpace your quoted UK peers in terms of the growth rate from international business? Mm, yeah, a couple of really good questions there. I think um, we, we are pleased with um, the acquisition network because it gave us distribution. Uh, we're, we're in um, 12 countries now that we wouldn't have been in otherwise. So we'd have been even more exposed to uh, the UK market and all of the issues we've just talked about there had we not made that acquisition. Um, it also enabled, uh, the deal enabled us to move into uh, other markets that we weren't in previously, as in um, telecoms and uh, generate a bigger IT business. So it's been very useful, but there's no doubt it has taken us a while to, to bed it down and to start to see um, a return on the investments that we've made. I think 2017 will turn out to have been the, the inflection point in that, um, in that journey and uh, I'm very excited about the future prospects for international business, particularly the US. Uh, and I believe that certainly in percentage improvement terms, we will substantially outpace our competitors, but that's really because we're starting at a lower base. Um, but uh, everyone has to start somewhere, and over time we expect to grow uh, international operations to become a substantial part of the group. Good. And, uh, and again, another follow-on with remarkable flow to these questions. In terms of taking engineering services uh, abroad, you mentioned your satisfaction with uh, the pace of growth in America. Uh, what about Asia? Uh, do you think that that is set to achieve a similar rate of growth? Uh, well, funnily enough, I think the, um, the actuals are, um, in fact, the opposite to what you've just expressed, Andy. We're, we're particularly pleased with the progress of the Matchtech brand in Asia. Uh, the rail projects are referred to in um, uh, Malaysia and the, the very rapid development of our matchtech business in China um, has been a great success for us. It's actually been rather slower to take off in, in the US and the markets where we're having success there are uh, in energy rather than in infrastructure. But I think it's only a matter of time. I think the opportunity we've got in the US in technology is so big, it's kind of absorbed all of management's attention. So I'm sure that our engineering business will gain more traction there as time goes on. Uh, definitely a question for Salah. 
Uh, can your new uh, CFO tell us what attracted him to take a job in what was for him in the recruitment space a relatively new sector given your past experiences? Certainly. Um, uh, my background is, is uh, predominantly in media and media is um, a people business as is Gattaca, um, typically a workforce that is young and dynamic and typically um, business models with very low barriers to entry. So. Whilst on the face of it, um, uh, it appears to be you know, quite a change, actually, um, there are a lot of similarities. And um, Gattaca is a great company. It, it's got um, uh, tremendous brands, in particular Matchtech, um, and I think there's substantial room for um, growth for the company and um, improvement. And so um, that, that's what attracted me. And perhaps also for you, Silla, given your debt levels uh, and your historic commitment to the dividend, does that mean M&A is off the agenda for the immediate future whilst you focus on profits and cash generation? Yeah, I think that, 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 that is right. Um, we've had um, one very sig significant acquisition in the last few years being um, uh, networkers and uh, slightly smaller RSL. We're very focused on... Um, uh, continuing to bed those down and, and uh, maximising um, the investment from those uh, acquisitions, uh, but also um, investing in organic growth, um, and uh, um, that 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 that's our uh, short-term agenda. And uh, I think it was also you so I meant you mentioned in terms of RSL uh, that there were some encouraging nascent signs of international interest yeah. in, in the product. Could you elaborate a little bit on that as to what and where uh, it is appealing? Yeah, sure. So it's Asia, I think probably Brian is is, is um, best placed uh, to talk to that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we won the, we're one of two suppliers to the high speed rail link between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, uh, and we're dealing with long established uh, clients like WSP and Mott McDonald. Um, and the skills that they require are very um, in very short supply. So we've now got the benefit of two databases to, to source from. Um, Matchtech's uh, traditional area of competence in rail is in design. Um, RSL's is more track side. So it's a good uh, blend of, of skills which lead to us having a much better offering to provide to our clients. Thank you. And perhaps the, the final question, um, looking at areas where business is going well for you, are you finding it easy to find the right people, i.e. Uh, staffing engineering technology as a unit? Are you converting internal employees or bringing in external people uh, who are versed in that offering? And a similar question in terms of the US growth, is it easy to find the, the right account managers uh, to develop the business there? It's never easy to find good people, uh, and it's one of our competitive advantages that um, we are rather better than our competitors at uh, retaining and engaging the staff that we, um, that we employ. We devote an awful lot of uh, energy and resource to, to doing that well, and we, uh, we measure engagement. Um, we track our progress on um, Glassdoor, which is an employer review site, to make sure that uh, we're hitting the mark and giving our staff what they need. Um, so it's never easy, but I think we're, we're doing quite well. In engineering technology, we've basically taken uh, people who understand uh, technology skill sets and implanted them into um, a business that focuses on engineering clients. So it's a good blend of skills that uh, work in particularly well for us. And in the US, really, we're on a, a journey from being a, um, a small business staffed mainly by expats uh, to becoming a truly US uh, entity. So we've got um, American management uh, who are increasingly hiring American nationals and training them up in the same way as we do in the UK to give, make sure that we capture the, the nuances of that market, which is um, slightly different from the UK model. So um, yeah, we're, we're well on the way to becoming um, uh, a, a truly international business rather than a UK business with a few international offices. Oh, we've just taken one last question. Uh, in terms of diversifying the client base in mm. telecoms, 
Uh, do you feel you're making progress then? We are, yes. Um, we, when, when we talk about diversifying our telecoms client base, it's not that we don't appreciate what we've got. You know, we have some terrific uh, corporate um, entities who depend on us for um, very specific services. So firms like Ericsson and Huawei are huge. Uh, but at the moment, we've been a kind of single product supplier to them, moving engineers around the world, rolling out networks. Um, each of those businesses would now see themselves not as telecom vendors, but as true technology businesses. And as such, they have research and development functions um, and um, you know, whole, whole business areas that historically we haven't supplied to. So our diversification is as much about diversifying the services that we provide to those clients as it is about finding new clients to supply services to. But uh, one of the business units that I mentioned earlier, the connected world, is a good example of looking outside of those very large um, multinational corporations for smaller disruptive businesses that are building around the Internet of Things uh, in places like Silicon Roundabout here in London and providing skill sets uh, to them because those very small employers, they find it hard to attract um, the, the candidates they need. So it's diversification that's going on on two levels really.